Hello and welcome to the Wellspring Tabernacle Podcast. Wellspring Tabernacle is a Bible-based Trinitarian Christian church in Marble, North Carolina. We seek to impact our community through preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ in power and demonstration of the Spirit of God. Thank you for listening to today's episode, and may God bless. But, <clears throat> that last song we just played, I love that song because it's, a lot of people don't, don't care for it, don't like it, um, because of, uh, um, um, of the person who sings it and all that. But I tell you this, Christ, as the Bible says, if we have hope in this life only in Christ Jesus, we're of all men most miserable. And he is our living hope. And this past week, you know, we were on, uh, we got to go on vacation, which is something we hadn't gotten to do in over a year. Um, and it was nice, you know, just to to get away and be able to to uh, detach just for a little, just for a few days from the cares and the and the woes of life. And uh, you know, when we got down there, um, we left. Uh, late late uh, Sunday night we left at midnight and um, got down there about 9.30 and of course I, I I had to sleep I was just exhausted beyond exhausted I'd been up for 27 or 28 hours so I slept for a little bit. We got up and went to the grocery store and then went over to the place we were staying. We got everything unpacked. And I stepped back outside just for a minute and I seen the I seen the ocean and I seen just just for a, a brief, brief moment, I thought of of the vastness of God. And, and just how small I was. And as I watched the as I watched the waves lap up on the shore, my mind immediately went to to a conversation that God had with Job. In Job thirty eight, the Bible says, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up now thy loins like a man, for I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare, if thou hast understanding, who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereof are the foundations thereof? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who shut up the sea with doors? When it break forth, as if it had issued out of the womb. When I made the cloud the garment thereof and, a, and thick darkness a swaddling band for it and break, up it break for it my decreed place and set bars and doors and said, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further. And here shall thy proud waves be stayed. I thought of just how great and of how vast God is, and 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 just in just in that briefest moment, in that fleeting moment that appears like a vapor and then vanishes, I was overcome with the presence of God, just in His creation, and I thought of what Paul said in Romans about how that you know that God is seen throughout the created world. And that any and I thought to myself, how could anyone look at j- just looking at the sea? How they could look at the ocean and not know and not realize that there is a great Creator 
who is who has fashioned and shaped this world. And I was just, I mean, it, it literally, it, it was a breathtaking moment. It took my breath away as I stood there just in awe of who God is and the vastness of his creation. And I, and I just for a brief time, I got out there and worshiped. And <clears throat> this morning, I told y'all, I told y'all last week that we were going to be starting a series this week and it's and it's going to be kind of odd when you hear the title of what this series is but this is going to be part one of a series titled what god can't do and when you think and how many of us here this morning have ever heard the phrase god can do anything or there's nothing that god can't do we've all we've all heard those right and when and when we hear those things, it gives us a good feeling, but it is a half truth. God can do anything as long as it doesn't violate his character. He is a holy God. He's a just God. He's a righteous God. Since God is holy, then he wouldn't and can't be unholy. Since he is just, he wouldn't do anything and cannot do anything that's unjust. Since God is righteous, he won't and can't be unrighteous. And for the next few weeks, we're going to look at the things that the Bible says God can't do. And you heard, you heard right. There are things the Bible says that God cannot do. They are impossible for him. What? Our God is omniscient. That means he's all-knowing. He's omnipotent, which means he's all-powerful. And he is omnipresent, which means he exists everywhere at the same time. How can something be impossible for him? How can God not be able to do something? And just what is there that God cannot do? If you have a Bible this morning, turn to the sixth chapter of the book of Hebrews. In this great book written by the Apostle Paul, if you don't believe Paul wrote Hebrews, then you have every right to be wrong. That's fine. <laughs> but in this great book, in chapter number 6, and starting in verse 17, the Bible says, Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability, the unchanging nature of his counsel confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things two unchanging things in which it was impossible for God to lie we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us which hope we have as an anchor of the soul both sure and steadfast and which entereth into that within the veil whether the forerunner for us is entered even Jesus made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now there is a lot to unpack in these verses and time will not permit me to unpack every grain of truth from this passage. But before, I want to pray before we go any further. Lord Jesus, we're thankful for this day, for the blessings of life. God, thank you for your presence with us this morning in the worship service. And God, now as the preaching hour has come, I pray that you would settle in this place again and let us worship you through your word. God, I pray that you would bless the reading of your word. And God, I pray this morning that you would manifest yourself in this service in ways that we ha that we need, God, in ways that you would have us to have this morning. Help us, Lord, to look at your word and what it says and see the truth that is there. Lord, I pray that you'd anoint me afresh, God, from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. Lord, forgive me where I've failed you, God. Fill me with the Holy Ghost again. Yes. God, bind the power of hell this morning. Any distraction that might be, any any wayward thought that would take us off of you, Lord, I pray, God, that you would that you would expunge that from our presence for this time. Lord, we'll thank you for it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. 
But this is a passage that I've looked at for, for, for years, literally. I've read it, I've pondered it, and I've studied it for a long, long time. And it's one of the most beautiful, deep, amazing, Just it's just a wellspring of life in this passage. And I want us to look at a few things and get to the, and get to the heart of this message. Firstly, we see one of these impossible statements here. The Bible says that it is impossible for God to lie. If this were literally translated from the Greek text, it would say that God is unable to be deceitful or to speak falsehoods. All right, now, since God cannot lie, this means that we can trust everything he has said to us in his word with Without reservation. Everything in his word is without a doubt unquestionably true in every way. God's inability to lie makes him the very foundation for what we know to be truth. All right. Jesus told his disciples over in John 14, Thomas came, he had just given that great passage. He just told that great passage about let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Well, Thomas comes to him and says, Lord, we do not know the way. And he looks at Thomas and he says, Thomas, I am the way. I am the truth. All right. God, Jesus, the, the, one of the things that sets Jesus apart from all the other great religious figures in the world is that, all right, we have Muhammad saying that he had found a way. He had found a way of getting to God. All right. We have, we have the, the different Buddhas that have been in this world look, saying that they were looking for enlightenment. All right. What separates Jesus from all of them is that he does not not claim to have a way. He does not claim to have a truth. He makes this bold statement that I am the way, the only way. I am the only truth that there is and I am the life. And it is through him that we have life and we have life more abundantly. But I mean, just imagine just for a minute what condition we would be in if God had ever told a lie. Think of the relationships that you have in your life that have been tainted by lies and by falsehood, that people have lied to us. And and that and I don't care what anyone says, when someone tells you one lie, it forever taints the relationship. And you always, in the back of your mind, you find yourself questioning every single thing that they have ever said from that point on. It would cause us to have endless questions and insecurities. If our God would could lie, we wouldn't be able to put all of our trust in him. We wouldn't be able to have unwavering faith in him. We wouldn't be able to say with absolute certainty that we know we are saved. We wouldn't be able to have any confidence in anything the Bible says. We would be without hope and without the guarantee of the gospel. If our great God has ever lied, we are in big trouble. But thankfully, we have a God that cannot lie, that it is impossible for him to utter falsehoods. God doesn't have the capacity to lie, much less the ability. Do you know what this means this morning? This means that when the Bible says that all things work together for the good of those who love God and are the called according to his purpose, that it means that thing, that we know it's true. We know when the Bible says that we have been hid with Christ in God, it's true. When the Bible says that the righteous have never been forsaken, bacon or their seed begging bread, we can believe it without question. And now before you say something, and I know that there are those here this morning that are saying, oh, well, you don't know what I'm going through. You don't know where I've been. I've gone through hell and people have treated me terribly. Where was God when all this trouble was going on? Where was God when I was fighting? And right, and even right now, when my family is in tatters and my life is falling apart at the seams, where is he? All right, first of all, humans are a really odd thing. We trust God with our souls, but seemingly think he's absent in our day-to-day lives. Who do you think is holding the seams of your tattered life together? Who do you think in the Bible says that God holds all things together by the word of his power? Who do you think is giving you strength to make it day after day? The Bible says that God upholds the righteous and he is right there with you through every step of this journey called 
life, God cannot lie. And Jesus said that he would never leave us or forsake us. All right, I want us to look really close at this text. The Bible says that God proves his immutability, his unchanging nature by a confirming oath that by two unchanging, immutable things, it is impossible for God to lie that we have a strong encouragement. We have a strong admonition. We have a strong exhortation or consolation because we have fled for refuge to the hope laid before us. And that hope we have this morning and every day of our lives is the hope that is found only in Jesus Christ and what he has done. One of the songs that we listened to this for worship this morning was a song called For You. And it ta- and the man who sung that is blind. Gordon Moat, the man who sung that song is blind. He can't see anything. So for him to be able to sing about worshiping God just for who God see we have we have worship all messed up in this daily life that we live in our Christian walk we have worship messed up all right when God blesses us we worship him when God gives us things we want to praise him and say oh thank you God but just as soon as bad times happen as soon as the boat that we're in on the sea of life begins to get a little rocky we want to jump out of the boat and start swimming back towards the shore. We want to say, oh God can't handle this mess that I'm in. God cannot handle these things that I'm going through. Friend, the God of the universe, he holds us in the hollow of his hand. He spoke, when he spoke in, he spoke the world into existence, All right, The Bible says that the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and that God said, let there be light. And it and it was and it just happened and then it says that the, that God separated the light from the darkness and the dark and the light he called day and the darkness he called night and it said then he divided the waters he said we cannot change we cannot do anything if we were to go down here to the actual creek of vengeance creek and bury it we would not change its course We could bury it underground and it would still flow the exact same way. We can't even at, if 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 people could it would be it would be neat if we could if we could you know Anthony and I would really like it if we could just cause our hair to grow and have a and have a head full of you know luscious locks that would be awesome but we can't do that. We serve a god that flung the stars from his fingertips. That as he drew, as he drug his finger across the landscape, caused mountains and valleys to appear and caused rivers to break forth. We serve a God that when he spoke to the ground, it immediately released all the growing plant life that we see. We see a God that when he spoke to the sea and said, bring forth life, that it immediately began to swim with all the amazing sea creatures that we see today. <coughs> and yet we think that he cannot help us or that he is somehow absent when we have problems in our lives. And yet he is there he is. constantly. He is holding our lives together. When we see tattered seams And what seems to be the end, God sees something to work with. When when the world sees something... That, that when the world sees a relationship, but there's a lot of talk in the news right now about the rights that parents have with their children, and there are some states that have even moved in a direction to remove rights from chi- to rights from parents about their children. All right, the world sees these relationships that we have as broken and and something that can be thrown away as easily as we would throw away a soiled napkin or. But God looks at those and he sees something that can be salvaged and something that can be built. 
and something that can be used mightily. I think of what's going on with Christina with her with her parents. When she and I first got together five or six years ago, she didn't have a relationship with her mom and she didn't have a relationship with her dad. And I have watched as God yes. has taken estranged relationships. Amen. God has taken people. My father-in-law, I've never even seen the man. I never spoke to him until last night on the phone and it was wonderful. I have a great relationship with my mother-in-law because of what God has done. He's taken the tattered edges of my wife's life and of her childhood and with grace has sewn it into a tapestry that is wonderful and beautiful to behold. We have a God that cannot lie this morning. And when he says that he works all things together for our good and for his glory, we can... We we can say yes that that is true regardless of what state our life is in right now regardless of what physical condition we might be in God is working yeah. all things together for his glory and for our good Amen. Amen. because we have been called according to his purpose and when we look at this text, all right, we look at it and it says <coughs> that because it's impossible for God to lie, that we have this encouragement, we have this guarantee because we have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. All right, now biblical hope is not like hope in today's world, all right? When we speak of the word hope, you know, we will say, I hope that it does not rain this week. We're talking about something that may or may not happen. But when the Bible uses the word hope, you have a, what we see there is a guarantee. Matter of fact, we could insert that word guarantee. We have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the guarantee set before us, which guarantee we have as an anchor of the soul. All right, biblical hope is, it is not the hope that we think of as something that may or may not happen, but it is an ironclad guarantee that when we have, and, 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 what, and how beautiful is it that, it paints this guarantee as a place of refuge. What did Jesus say while he was on earth? He said, come to me, all you that are weary and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. All of us that labor and are weary in, in life, the Bible says that, that Jesus says, come to me. Give it to me. Peter said it this way. Peter, being the fisherman that he was, said for us to cast all of our cares on him because he cares for you. Why was that? Because they, Christ was showing us how taking refuge in him works. When we take refuge in Christ, all of the things that we were burdened with now become His burdens because He is the burden bearer. All of the things that so easily beset us in this life, Paul said they're not even worthy to be compared to the glory that's going to be revealed one day. It might Christianity is not something that is for sissified people. It's not something for people that are not strong. It takes strength to put faith in something that we cannot see and that we have not yet seen. But just as Jesus told Thomas in John four, in, in, in the Gospel of John, he told him, he said, he said, Thomas, because you've seen, you believe. But blessed are they who have not seen and yet believe. All right, I was not there when Jesus stepped out on the bow of a ship and spoke, peace be still, to a raging hurricane. I was not there when he took five loaves of bread and two fish and blessed it and fed thousands. I was not there when the disciples was out on a boat 
And all of a sudden, he came walking to them on the waves of the water just as we would walk across the ground. I was not there when he cried out on the cross, it is finished, and gave up the ghost. And the rocks began to shake and the veil of the temple was ripped in twain. I was not there for that. But I can tell you when I was there. I was there on February the 18th of 2010 as a wretched lost sinner when the God of all heaven showed me who I was in my sin and drew me to himself by the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, I was not there, all right, when my wife stopped talking to her dad when she was 18 years old, but I was there last night when by the movement of God the Holy Ghost, she reached out and called him and we got to speak to him. I was not there to watch her mama go through all the trouble that she went through with drug addiction and all these things, but I was there the morning just last year when God reached out and saved a wretched sinner. Rita, I wasn't there when you went through all the hell that you went through in your life, but I've watched over the past 10 or 15 years as God has moved in your life and in your family. I'm, and I, I may not be there for some of the things my children go through, but I know that there'll be a God that it's impossible for Him to lie who will be there to uphold them and to strengthen them. Yes, amen. Amen. So when the Bible says that God can't do something, we don't need to focus in on what God can't do, but what that means that God can do. When it says it's impossible for God to lie, that means that everything He speaks, everything written in His Word is undoubtable truth. That's it. Amen. Amen. And to, have, to hold in our hands this morning, to hold in your hand a book that is filled with with page after page of undefiled, unadulterated truth. Do you know there is no other book in the world that can claim what this book can claim? There is no other book in the world that the Bible said he in describing itself. It said that the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. You know why people can't stand this book? Because it is living and it is powerful and it cuts and it pierces. Even the Bible says to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit, the joy in the marrow and that it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart and that there is nothing that is not laid open and manifest before it. Right, amen. That's why people people want the truth until they get the truth. Right. And then, as, as to quote Jack Nicholson in that movie from a few years back, they can't handle the truth. That's it, that's it, that's it, that's it. But I am thankful to know this morning that we have a God who cannot lie. That's right. Amen. Amen. And to say that God cannot lie is not to diminish Him, but it glorifies Him. Right. We don't have to wonder whether when God said that He would never leave us nor forsake us, but go with us all the way. We don't have to wonder if he meant what he said, we can know without question that that's exactly what he not only meant, but what he does. When he said that he saw the tears of a mother and was moved with compassion, we don't have to wonder if that was the case. We can know that that was indeed the case. When he said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We can know that he makes us to lie down in green pastures and he leads us beside still waters and that he anoints our heads with oil and our cup runs over and that surely goodness and mercy would follow us all the days of our life. Why? He does all of that for us for his name's sake. That even when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil because He is with us. 
Because it's impossible for our God to lie. This morning I know that there are people who will hear this sermon and will and will say, well, I'm not sure about that, but I want you to examine your life. And I want you to look at your life and I want you to find me one time when God ever lied to you. You show me one time when God ever uttered a falsehood or was deceitful and you will have proven the word of God wrong and I will close up shop and never preach again. You will look at your life and you will see where people have lied and mistreated you and some of them may have even mistreated and lied to you in the name of Jesus. <laughs> but just because someone lies about someone or using someone's name to lie doesn't mean that the thing they used ever lied. That's right. That's right. That's right. You know, people, I, I was sharing last week about that lady, you know, that, that asked, that was, that was so violently abused as a child in church. You know, and she asked, where was God? Where was God when that happened? Why did he sit idly by? And I honestly believe this. I honestly believe that God is working in that woman's life and that he is going to bring her to himself. Amen. 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 And that when he does that, she is then going to see just exactly where God was in the midst of all that pain. In the midst of all that trauma, in the midst of all that hurt, we have a lady here that lives locally that just buried her buried her son. I don't know if y'all heard about see they were in a wreck and one of her children died as a result. Yeah. And they just had his funeral this past week. That mother is going to look at that situation. An unimaginable pain. And she is going to know that God is there giving her the strength to get up in the morning. Giving her the strength to live her life. How do we know that? How do we know that God is always there? How do we know? Because it is impossible for God to lie. God cannot lie. And he has said that he will never leave us nor forsake us. So I hope this morning that you take away some comfort and peace in knowing just one of the things that God cannot do. Thank you for listening to today's episode of the Wellspring Tabernacle Podcast. If you feel led to do so, please give us a review on the platform of your choice And if you would like to reach out to us further, please email us at wellspringtabernaclenc at gmail.com. Until next week, may God bless you.